The IV Post Libraries Confederation is a partnership between 13 leading academic research libraries listed here. Um, so it's the Ivy League um, plus a few additional uh, institutions, including MIT, Johns Hopkins, Duke is one of the, the plus, I guess, um, Stanford, the University of Chicago. Um, and together, we collectively provide access to a rich and unique record of human thought and creativity through resource sharing and collaboration. Um, so what that means is that we pool our resources to provide services um, to those uh, participating institutions. Um, so one of the services is the program that I lead, which I'll give you the, the overview of that in a second. Um, there's also Bar Direct, which some of you may or may not be familiar with. Uh, if you're not familiar with Bar Direct, it's a great resource where um, if, if you're at Duke and Duke does not have a book that you're looking for, you can probably get it from any one of the listed institutions here and it will arrive in three days. Um, so it's pretty great. I've used it. I love it. Um, it's similar to inter, uh, interlibrary loan, I guess. I have some numbers, and this is kind of how I'll structure um, this presentation. Um, I'll talk about the, the way that our librarians and our related staff actually get involved in this program. Um, so it's geared towards subject specialists, librarians, uh, other faculty, researchers that work closely with the libraries and library collections. Um, I'll share examples of some of our collections. I don't have time. I was saying earlier it takes probably an hour and a half for me to walk through every collection that we have. So I'll share some, some recent collections and some, some, some collections, excuse me, that I think really illustrate what it is that we're trying to do. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, projects that people can, can do with archived web pages um, and archived web resources, and then open it up for questions and answers. And I'm happy to answer general questions about web archiving or questions about our program in, uh, in particular. Um, but so individuals will propose their collection, they'll come to the committee, and the committee will either approve or reject their collection uh, or ask them to revise, like I said. And from there, um, I will work with the groups to get them up and running into actual collections. So what that means is that um, I typically create a spreadsheet for them, and these individuals basically list all the websites that they'd like to collect and provide associated metadata. Um, so they might provide creator names or subject headings, um, descriptions. This is especially helpful when some of our collections are in languages that are not English, so I, I don't speak a lot of uh, other languages or any other languages. Um, so I can look at a website and I can tell you that yes, it's a website, but I can't describe it. Um, so that's where the subject specialists come in and they can tell me what I'm looking at and um, provide metadata. Um, and I do all the technical work. So I do the crawling, um, I make it public, I create bibliographic records. Um, so it's a really nice partnership between subject specialists who know what's out there to collect, who know what they want, and myself, um, and I have the technical ability to make this happen. So it's a true partnership, and I think one of the things that I really like working, that I really like about working with subject specialists um, is that they know what's in danger and what's at risk and what needs to be collected, and if I were to just approach the entire web, I would have no idea where to start. Um, once they've gotten all their uh, people together, they, pro they formally propose a collection to what's called the Web Advisory Committee. And so this is a group of, I think, six, um, plus myself as a non-voting member, that reviews and accepts or rejects proposals. Um, I would say we more accept and ask people to revise than we do reject, um, mostly helping folks clarify what it is that they really like to collect. Um, there are some aspects of web collecting that's really tough um, that we don't that we don't or we can't engage in right now due to the the resources and the and the the number of people we actually have working on this program. Something that we really struggle with that I'd be happy to talk about is collecting social media. Um, so we really are collecting web resources and not Twitter and not Facebook. Um, it's kind of a it's very fraught. <laughs> collecting Twitter and Facebook is really hard to do in the tools that we have just aren't great um, for that right now. Um, but so individuals will propose their collection, they'll come to the committee, and the committee will either approve or reject their collection uh, or ask them to revise, like I said. And from there, um, I will work with the groups to get them up and running into actual collections. So what that means is that um, I typically create a spreadsheet for them, and these individuals basically list all the websites that they'd like to collect and provide associated metadata. Um, so they might provide creator names or subject headings, um, descriptions. This is especially helpful when some of our collections are in languages that are not English, so I, I don't speak 
a lot of uh, other languages or any other languages. Um, so I can look at a website and I can tell you that yes, it's a website, but I can't describe it. Um, so that's where the subject specialists come in and they can tell me what I'm looking at and um, provide metadata. Um, and I do all the technical work. So I do the crawling, um, I make it public, I create bibliographic records. Um, so it's a really nice partnership between subject specialists who know what's out there to collect, who know what they want, and myself, um, and I have the technical ability to make this happen. So it's a true partnership, and I think one of the things that I really like working, that I really like about working with subject specialists um, is that they know what's in danger and what's at risk and what needs to be collected, and if I were to just approach the entire web, I would have no idea where to start. Um, so I'm gonna share some, some collections with you that I think really illustrate the breadth of this program. Um, so that's what I've highlighted here. Um, <laughs> this is, uh, I, I included this because I think almost everybody is familiar with this. Um, this is a, a web comic. Um, so one of our collections is called the Global Web Comics Web Archive. It's a really fun collection to work on. Um, it's one of our more, uh, I guess, more pop culture, more topical. Um, this has been used a lot when people are talking about like politics. Um, <laughs> but this is, I, I point to this because um, Columbia has a, a great comics collection and this is stewarded by Karen Green at Columbia who is the uh, comics collector and Sarah Wenzel at Chicago who collects comics there. And um, I think this collection is a, is a really interesting uh, way to collect uh, material that just doesn't exist in print, right? Um, excuse me, web comics inherently live on the web. And so they, they have um, proposed a collection that they could not build in print. Um, and so I really, I like this example. It's also an example of, of being really keyed into topical events and, and current affairs. A lot of the comics um, are political or they are, um, they're like narrative comics about current events. Um, and so I think this is a really good example of, of what you can do uh, when something just doesn't exist in print and there would be a collecting gap. And um, so this is, this is a collection that I always like to show. Um, this is uh, called Gun Show Comic and this is actually from 2013 but it became a meme on the internet and now this guy, this author sells plush dolls of this little dog that's on fire so his career kind of exploded. Um, and now we have this. <laughs> Uh, another one of our collections that uh, I think really illustrates the fragility of the web is um, this, uh, it's called the State Elections uh, Web Archive, and it is 2,000 or so uh, resources um, or web pages of individuals running for local office um, in 10 plus Ivy plus states, so uh, Mississippi and uh, Mississippi and Louisiana are the two that we've added this year, but it started with um, New York, Massachusetts, North Carolina, Cal uh, California, Illinois, et cetera. Um, and we capture people running for state Senate and state house. Um, and so these are uh, just extremely fragile. So what we found is that of the 2,000 or so web pages that we have, uh, we crawl once before the election to capture their campaign site. And I included this person because they were running in North Carolina. I don't know if they won or lost. Somebody might know. Um, and then the day after the election, the website disappears if they lose. So of the 2,000 plus websites, we have about 900 of them are gone. So we have a snapshot of, of their issues, of the YouTube videos that they produced, of the things that they said, of the pictures they took, and they just disappear from the web. Um, we will keep this collection going I guess in perpetuity. Um, 2020 will crawl again. Uh, 2021 was is a weird New Jersey votes in the off years for some reason. Um, so we crawl this collection every year, and it'll keep getting bigger and bigger. Um, and I think it's, I think it's a really great collection because there's a lot of really specific metadata, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this um, when we talk about potential research projects. Um, but this is a, a great collection that I think really illustrates, like I said, the fragility of the web. These are, these are resources that are not meant to live on forever. Um, they disappear, somebody loses, they don't want to pay for the domain anymore, and they're gone. Um, so that's one of our collections. So one use case for using web collections is to trace the evolution of a web page. Um, so pretty basic stuff. You don't really have to have a lot of technical experience to do this. Um, so we've been collecting the composer Philip Glass's web page since 2014. 
So this is what it looks like in 2014, and this is what it looks like today. Um, so maybe not extremely high stakes, Philip Glass's website, but you can do this with any website, right? You can go back in time, you can see what it looked like, you can see what an organization's mission was or what their goals were. Um, which PDFs did they have up then and what do they have up now? And you can put two things side by side and, and really look at the change. And um, you know, this becomes, I think, the longer this program exists, the more beneficial this, this, is, this becomes. Um, Philip Glass didn't change his website at all this year, but you can see over five years it's changed quite a bit. Um, so that's one use case for Web Archives, kind of a, a, an easier introduction. Um, this is a really cool, <laughs> this is a really cool project. Um, the DC Public Library has a, it's called the DC Punk Web Archive, and they collect websites of, of punk musicians and concert, uh, concert web pages and concert hall web pages. And uh, somebody ran a, a program to pull out all the images from this collection. I have no idea how to do this, but you can do it. Um, and what you can see are like ticket stubs and like concert posters and flyers. And this might be a dog. I don't know, um, but it's a really cool visual, visualization of um, what you can do. You can pull out images. So I could see this being done, for instance, with our um, Latin American art collection, for instance, pulling out artist work and displaying it in this way so you can kind of get a handle on what it is that you're actually collecting. So if you imagine this in print, it takes up, well, I don't know, several boxes maybe. Um, if you collect it um, digitally or, or from the web, you can arrange it in this way. Um, so this was a really cool project. It was done by um, Nick Ruess uh, out of the University of Waterloo. Um, and I can share his information as well. This program does notify almost everybody, uh, website owners, that, we've, that we're collecting their web page. Um, and we give them the opportunity to opt out. So if they do have an issue with it, they can, they can opt out. I send an email, I say, you know, like, congratulations, you've been selected by these institutions. And 95% of the time, people are extremely excited. They're like, this is an honor. I love this. This is so great. Every once in a while, somebody will object and will say, you know what, that's fine. We, we just, we won't call your website. And it kind of ends there. Uh, Ivy Plus has never received a takedown request. Um, I work at Columbia. I work very closely with Columbia's web archive or web archivist. They've received one takedown request. And, it was this individual who used to write for the student paper, and now he's running for office, and he wrote something that he didn't, he doesn't want people to know about. Um, so he went to Columbia, and he said, I don't want this in, in your web archive anymore. And Columbia said, go to the Internet Archive, because it's there too. And if they take it down, we'll take it down. And they did. And so Columbia removed public access. Um, I think it does become kind of a risky a risky, uh, to have an opt-out policy is kind of a risky game because I don't know if, if the Chinese government was like, hey, take that down. The reason that we are collecting it is because they don't, right? They don't want, they don't want it to be collected. Um, I'm really hopeful that that just doesn't happen. <laughs> I'm hopeful that we fly enough under the radar that the Chinese government doesn't come for us. Um, there are collections, though, where we don't ask for permission or we don't notify. We never ask for permission. We don't notify. Um, this is one of them, the state elections. Our reasoning was these people are running for public office. This is their public-facing site that they have created for voters. We'll go ahead and crawl it. Uh, the other was our collection of extremist materials on the web. I didn't feel like emailing <laughs> uh, a bunch of Nazis. Um, we also didn't want them to receive an email from us and and think we were endorsing their behavior. Um, so there is some give and take uh, with this. Um, I, I said, we don't ask for permission. This program used to ask for permission where we would write and we would say, we need you to give us written permission. And nobody ever wrote back. They didn't know what we were talking about. They didn't, whatever. So we would ask again and they wouldn't write back. Finally, we just said, we're just going to notify. And uh, that's worked pretty well. Um, I, think, I think this is a really, it's a good conversation to have. Um, I think there are a lot of ethical questions. I, the, one of the reasons we don't collect social media is because I, it's very, very hard to find contact information for 500 Twitter users, right? Um, and to tell them that we're collecting their, their tweets. Um, and then somebody else will say, well, they knew what they were doing when they, they were on Twitter. So it's, it's, a very, 
it's a very hard question, and I'm sorry I don't have anything more concrete, like, well, the law says, um, because it doesn't. <laughs> um, you know, in other countries, uh, it's, it's, it falls under legal deposit. So Australia, Canada, um, the British Library, they all do web archiving because they're legally mandated to collect anything under the .uk domain or the .ca domain. We don't have that in the United States. Um, so we kind of follow the lead of the Library of Congress. They were kind of the first ones to do this. And we figure if they can do it, we can do it. And we'll see what happens. 